Ken Bailey, and I'm very happy that you have chosen to continue in your study together with me of some of the great passages of the New Testament that set out for us the mission of the Christian and the mission of the Christian community. We arrived in our last study to the great cluster of parables of, of light and salt which occur in the fifth chapter of Matthew. To be sure that they are before us, let's again read them. If you care to, you may want to open to Matthew chapter 5 and start in verse 13 or to follow along on the screen with us. The text reads, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. At the end of our last study, we looked at the properties of salt and the properties of light. And we said that this is kind of the traditional way in which this text is usually examined. But no, we want to ask the question, why do we have these three parables together in a cluster? One parable on salt and two parables about light. The salt is the salt which, which uh, if it disintegrates, is thrown out. And the light of the bushel, uh, sorry, the lamp that is in the house, or the light of the city that is set on a hill. Now, the first thing we want to do is to take salt and light, and we want to examine their contrasts. What are the points at which there is a difference between the way salt works and the way light works? When we finished with that list, we will then look at the comparisons, at what points are salt and light somewhat similar. And let's try and figure out what our Lord is saying. Now, this list is amazingly long. We're going to find eight different ways in which the two are contrasting and six different ways in which they are comparable. And you could ask yourself and say, well, now, gee whiz, I mean, uh, this is an awful lot of stuff that you're getting out of this text. Are you sure you're not sort of dumping your own ideas on it? I hope I'm not. But what I perceive in these very carefully crafted parables, as we have indicated before, they are like a great diamond. And they shed light in a variety of directions. And depending on who the audience is, depending on where you're coming from, depending on who you are, you're going to find a different face of that diamond that is flashing light back to you. Sometimes we can easily say that any parable is like a table. Only the parable, unlike the table, does not stand on all four legs. That is, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, does he mean that we're stupid animals? No. Well, how do we know he doesn't mean that? It's because that meaning would not be in harmony with the rest of the things that Jesus teaches. Or when he says, I am the door, does that mean he is a lifeless piece of wood and has nothing to say? I mean, doors don't talk. No because that interpretation, although it fits the idea of a door, is not appropriate to extract out of the parable because it is not in harmony with the rest of the message of Jesus. I think there's our control and corrective. We must not allow ourselves to draw out of the parable ideas which are not in harmony with the rest of the teachings of Jesus. But we are free to find that the great diamond sheds light in a variety of directions, and this allows us to, as it were, unpack the theological content of the great metaphors of Jesus, of which these three metaphors are a part, and notice their prominence. In the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, right after the great Beatitudes, these are the first images that are set before the reader. So the contrast. First of all, salt works invisibly, and light works visibly. When we carry out our witness as disciples or the church engages in mission, there are aspects of the way we witness to our faith that are visible. Everybody sees it. 
And there are aspects of the way in which we carry out our ministry that are invisible. You don't see that salt working on that meat, preserving those pickles, cleansing that wound, because the salt was a disinfectant for the people of the ancient Middle East. It's doing its work, but very, very quietly. There are people who say, no, 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 ministry only really matters if it's a big deal and it's out front and everybody can see it. An awful lot of Christian ministry takes place very quietly, and no one knows that that ministry is being engaged in except the people involved. Ministry is for a church sometimes very quiet, and ministry for an individual is many times a very quiet affair in which damage is done. It's not really going to work unless it is very quietly done, invisible to those around. But then at the same time, we've got two visions of mission here. We've talked about these before, but let's look at them afresh. And this can be called in technical language the centrifugal and the centripetal forces of mission. In this case, we're looking at the two parables on light and not looking at light and salt. And perhaps this explains partly why Jesus gives us two parables and not one. The city set on the hill sheds its light out beyond the community. It's out there in that darkness beyond. But, and it's out to the world, sure enough, out there. At the same time, the light that is in the house is only seen by the people who come in. You're not going to find that light or see it or be enriched by it or be enlightened by it unless you come into the house. And you can look at a study of the history of mission all across the centuries by looking at those two forces. Has this community been willing to reach out beyond itself? And has this individual or community created the quality of life and fellowship within itself that others are attracted in. Certain periods of the life of the church, the church has said worldwide has said, worship continues. We are celebrating the mysteries of God. We have the sacraments. If anybody wants to wander in, they can't. And the people who sort of see this as the vision of mission that is required, they take the words of institution and where Jesus, when he gives the Holy Communion to his disciples, he says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he come. And the word to show forth is the word to proclaim. You preach the Lord's death. You proclaim the Lord's death. You evangelize with the Lord's death until he come. And so the folks who were kind of stuck on this side of that particular uh, two-sided coin, as it were, say, aha, here we are. We have the sacraments. That's all that is required of us because the sacraments themselves are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Fine. That's fair. It does. That's there. The light is seen when you come into the house and only if you come into the house. But the other image, not only is our task to be like the lamp put on the lampstand in the house, but it is to be the city that is set on the hill where the light goes beyond ourselves. And the two are necessarily interrelated. There's no point in bringing someone in from that darkness unless there is the warm glow of light within the house. There is no point in bringing that lost sheep from the hillsides unless somebody back there has chopped up some clover for that poor hungry sheep to eat, because what's the point of bringing him home if you're not going to feed him? There's no point in having one of these without the other in balance. I have been in churches in which people are, oh man, they're gung-ho for foreign missions, and they're ready to give money for missions all over the world. But the people across the street well, I mean, they're not our kind, you know. I mean, they just, well, they're not in our economic level. They don't dress as nicely as we do. And, well, they're not the kind of people whose company we enjoy. So what are they doing? They're letting their light shine out like 
the light of the city that is set on a hill way out there in places long ways away and they're happy to pay professionals like me to go and be a witness halfway around the world so that they won't feel badly of the fact that they really don't care about the people across the street that they really whose company they really don't enjoy there we are the light on the hill and trying to put the lamp that is supposed to be there for those who come in and trying to put that lamp out no this vision tells us of both. Then we find that there is another contrast that is in these two images. One is the light is specifically for the cosmos. It is for the world. And at the same time, we are told that the salt is the salt of the earth. Read it rather, the land. Whenever you get the word ha'aretz in Hebrew, and you get somebody like our Lord or one of the prophets using this great Hebrew word, and certainly that's the word that would be behind this Greek word, which is gay, from which we get agriculture. And it's the same root. In, in Greek, it sort of beefs up into English as the word agriculture, and you can translate it the earth. But we're really not talking about a farming image here. And whenever someone of the first century Jewish tradition and all of the prophets and, and saints before that are talking with this word, you have to ask, does it mean the earth or does it mean the land, namely the holy land, the land of Israel? In this case, I think that's what it means. And I think Jesus has given two images. And one is that the light is meant to go out to the world, everybody out there, the outside community. This, in a sense, is related to what we just talked about, but has a different edge. It is also meant for the inner community. The message is for the aritz, the people who are like us, our own inner community, and their need to see that light and to be drawn to it. Then fourth, there is the danger of hiddenness. We're talking about contrasts. The city that is set on the hill cannot be hidden. No way. Impossible. Don't try. You're not going to manage. The very fact that the light is on the hill means it's going to shine out. Ah, now people really shouldn't put a lamp under a bushel. They should put it on a lampstand, but they can put it under the bushel if they want to. And we know lots of people who do. So there is that danger on one side that the lamp might be hidden, and there is the impossibility of the light being hidden because it is like a light that is in a city on the top of a hill. Aspects of the gospel, we don't have to worry about them. They are going to come out our pores. People are going to inevitably know that here's the church on the corner. There are people there. They come to worship. They are engaged in ministry, and it cannot be hidden. And there are other ways there is the danger of hiddenness. We move into the marketplace. We move into the secular world. Or in the case of where I live, where I have spent my life in the Arab world, as Christians we move into the world of Islam. And there is that tremendous danger that we, in order to play it safe, we try to push that light back there under the bushel rather than allowing it to be seen on the lampstand. And then fifth, we can talk about the question of distance. Light works at a distance. Salt only functions if it's in contact with the food or the meat or the wound. If the salt is that far away, it's useless. A brilliant light can shine light at great distance. Discipleship is also ministry. Mission is also of these two kinds. There are times, places, in which the ministry we are doing is at a distance. We are a part of a team. Maybe we sit at a desk. Maybe we shuffle papers. Maybe we work cameras. Maybe, we are a, maybe we're sitting writing books in, a, in, a, in an office. Maybe we are engaged in some kind of work in which the actual light that is being shed is not something in which we have direct contact. We are a part of a team that finally that light goes out far beyond us. We may not even see the people on whom that light shines. I am engaged in things of this kind. 
because I am privileged to write books trying to interpret the faith, both in English for the English-speaking world and in Arabic for the Arabic Christian world. And I sit there and I spend hours and hours and days and days trying to research out these texts, try to understand them afresh from the culture of the Middle East. And I sit say to myself, gee, I wonder if anybody out there ever really reads this stuff. And I'm delighted when I find that maybe someone has and they're helped by it. The light at a distance. But at the same time, also we are called upon to be salt until you touch the deepest hurt in that wound, unless you actually are in contact with that food and bring a quality of a life and flavor to it, nothing is going to happen. We can be in the same office with somebody and we never touch them. We can work in the same building and never touch them. We can be a part of the same teaching staff and never touch them. We can pass them day after day after day and pass like trains in a night. And ministry like the salt doesn't happen until we touch where those people really are. I think Jesus is talking about both. Then we also notice that the results of failure are different. The light, if it goes out, strike a match and relight it. But Jesus says if the salt loses its saltiness, it's worthless. Forget it. Throw it out. No comeback. No recovery. Now here we find a, a very puzzling problem in that in the Greek text, the word that is used in Greek for saying that the salt has lost its saltiness is really the word for becoming stupid. It's from, we get the English word moron from it. So it really says in Greek, if the salt be, turns into a moron, very peculiar. And any chemist will tell you that salt is an element that is very, very stable. It doesn't change form. You can heat it, it's still salt. You can dry it out, it's still salt. Get it wet, nothing happens. Put it aside, air it, don't air it. I mean, it's a very, very stable chemical, unlike other chemicals that all kinds of things in it can quickly change into something else. So what, why does Jesus take the image of salt? Why does he take something that when you really look at it, this doesn't change at all? How can the salt lose its saltiness? Because as salt, it never does. That's, folks, because the kind of salt which we have on our tables has been purified. The companies that take the stuff, they, they make it pure, and they take out whatever other bits and pieces are in the salt, and so when we shake it on our meat, it's pure salt. But the salt of the first century was not like that. The only places that they could get salt, really, was it would come in from flat salt lakes in Cyprus, or on the Sea of Galilee, they would take water out, uh, sorry, the Dead Sea, they would take water out, it would dry up, and then they would scrape up the salt after it had dried, or sometimes they would do that along the Sea of Mediterranean itself, although it was kind of harder there because the percentage of salt wasn't that high. And this salt has impurities in it. And if the impurities reach a certain level, then the salt becomes very unstable. And we've got stories from the 19th century of some time in which uh, somebody thought that the price of salt was going to go up, and so he went out and bought a whole bunch of sacks of the stuff, put it in his basement, whoops, his basement was a bit damp, and the stuff got damp, and as it got damp, it decomposed. And even accounts that I have read of the 19th century, when they were still using this unpurified salt, that the poor fellow who put all this money into those bags of salt, what's he going to do? Well. Uh, you can't uh, throw it in the backyard, it'll poison the ground. You can't throw it on your fields because your animals might uh, eat too much of it and it wouldn't be good for them. Besides, you're not going to grow anything wherever you put that. You can't put it on your compost pile because it will destroy its effectiveness. What are you going to do? Well, the only place you can get rid of it is throw it out in the street and people walk on it. And the idea of feet and of walking on something is an incredible insult. The stuff you dump in the street is the stuff that is absolutely worthless and you don't care what happens to it and it is unclean and it is polluted and people walk on it. So what is Jesus talking about? I think he's talking about the fact that the gospel which we receive within our cultures always has impurities in it. Inevitably, it's going to have bits and pieces 
from the language and culture of which we are a part. And those bits and pieces are gradually fused into the gospel as we see it. And we are not even sensitive to those. And it really takes somebody from beyond us to point those out. And that if those impurities reach a certain level, we're going to have trouble because the whole thing is going to decompose and finally end up to be worthless. Again, this great theologian, Daniel Thambai Raja Niles of India, gives us a wonderful story about this, not in his writings, but one of his, one of his lectures, which a friend of mine attended and heard in person, in which he said, look, you people are always talking about the indigenization of the gospel, the gospel taking root within the culture. He said, come to me to South India and I'll show you churches in which half of the church became Christian from a background of high-class Hinduism and the other half of the church came from a background of the low-class Hindus, the outcasts. Their grandfathers were street sweepers, so they're worshiping in one church. So when they come to have communion, what happens? Well, they've got two communion tables, one up up on the platform and another one down below. And if your grandfather was a Brahmin, a high-class Hindu, you can jolly well take your communion from the upper table because you're really first-class Christian. And if your grandfather was an outcast, a street sweeper, you can have your communion from the lower table so these upper folks up there won't get upset. Come on. At the very point, at the most sacred point in which we affirm our oneness in Christ, you're going to divide the community on the basis of the caste system of your grandfathers? You've got to be kidding. The Indian who sits there doesn't sense the problem. They're just doing it the Indian way. The person from outside that culture will perceive that this is outrageous. And so we need people from beyond ourselves to be in our midst to point out, for example, the places at which we have made the cross and the flag a single symbol, and we have polluted the gospel by so doing. And finally, in terms of the contrasts, we notice that men and women are involved. This is kind of lost in the translation. I was reading from the Revised Standard, which has a mistake in it. I hope it's corrected in the, in the future. It says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. And everybody knows, of course, that men are the builders and that they build the cities in the Middle East as other places in the world. Then verse 15 in Greek says, nor do they light a lamp. Well, unfortunately, the translators of the Revised Standard said, nor do men light a lamp. The word men is simply not in the text. It just says, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a bushel but on a stand. And of course, everybody knows that the task of lighting lamps in a Jewish household is the task of the women. And indeed, in the Babylonian Talmud, it talks about the certain tasks of the women which are really bad news uh, uh, for which the woman has really got to be, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, corrected if she makes mistakes in these areas, it mentions three, and one of them is the lighting of the lamps. And so what has Jesus done? He's taken parables, one of which is clearly and distinctly from the life experience of men, and the other is clearly and distinctly from the life experience of women, and has put them together into a single collection of parables, affirming the importance in his mind that his message should reach the deepest levels of everybody listening to him, both the men and the women. Okay, there we are, eight contrasts. Now let's look briefly at the points of comparison. What do we find? Well, in a sense, both can fail. The light can be hidden under the bushel. You're stupid if you do it, but it's possible. And the salt, if there are too many impurities, can decompose. There is that danger. Not that the failure is as in the failure of the ministry of Jesus, that Judas walked away. But no, the failure can come out of our inadequacies and failures. And second, we notice that both are costly. Both burn up energy. 
There's no light that has ever been shining at any time anywhere in the world. But what that light burned up some energy somewhere. There was fuel going into that light. And salt is not effective in any of the ways in which salt serves us except as that salt melts. One of the problems, I think, in ministry is that we need the energy to carry it out. Actually, three things are required. First of all, we have to have a task. And second, we have to have the tools for that task. And third, we have to have the energy to carry it out. You've got to see that there is a room which needs to be swept, and you've got to get your hands on a broom, and then you've got to get yourself up out of the chair and get the job done. And Paul, in the 12th chapter of Corinthians, talks about these and says that the Spirit gives to you the gifts and that the Lord gives to you your, uh, your task, because the Lord assigns the tasks to us, and, and thereby assigns for us the specific thing that we're supposed to do, and then God gives to us the energy, energizes us, and in a sense we've got the Trinity involved. And then the third thing we notice by comparisons is that both are for the purpose of serving others. That salt is not in the salt shaker sitting there on the table because it looks nice, because it's serving itself. It is there to be used on the meat which you eat. And the lamp is not there in the corner of your room or over your bed or on your desk because it's serving itself. It is there to serve the person whom that lamp is there to serve. The purpose of ministry is not to serve ourselves but others. There are people who play tricks with themselves. They're out there in ministry because they have inner needs which they need to satisfy. And they're not there really to serve others. They've got to get an audience together to listen to them witness because they have inner needs. And never mind what's being said and never mind whether or not they really care for you. They've got to offload this thing which they're doing. No, says Jesus, through these parables we find out that ministry is for others and not for ourselves. And finally, in term, in also in terms of comparisons, we notice that both are indispensable. What is this all about? This tells us that Jesus, when he picked these illustrations, did not say, you are the phylacteries of the world, the special little leather boxes which Jews of the first century made and put words of the Torah and tied it on their foreheads when they went to their prayers. He doesn't say, you are the church bells of the world. And some places they don't have bells, and they call people to assemblies by banging on stones which make a noise, or wooden plaques which make a noise. He doesn't say you are the prayer rugs of the earth and lots of people don't have rugs. He takes light and salt. I can't imagine anything he could have picked that is more universally found in every culture everywhere in the world irrespective of your language and your history and your tradition than these two events. Every house has to have light and we cannot get along without the salt which our bodies need. The pioneers of America could only spread out across this great land as they could find salt because without salt they couldn't preserve their food and thereby they couldn't make it through the winter. And sure enough, Jesus is talking about his message, which is a universal for all. And please notice that both make a statement about the nature of that world out there. It says, the light says that the world is dark and needs light. And the salt tells us that there is something out there that is rotting and tasteless and infected. There's something wrong with the world which the light and the salt will correct. It makes a statement about the nature of the context within which light and salt do their work. And finally, we find out that both assume a given. When we're told that we are the salt of the earth and we are the light of the world, we notice that Jesus is talking to the disciples. He sees the disciples and goes up the mountain and sits down and talk, talks to them. Why? Because it is his light and his salt that has created them into light and salt. There can be no pride in ministry. We are not going out with our brilliance or with our talents. We are light and salt only 
as his gifts have turned us into light and salt. And so perhaps with these contrasts and comparisons, we can dig into the tremendous riches that are in these parables of Jesus as he presents them to us in this cluster of parables which come to us in verses together and impact upon us and our understanding of our discipleship and our mission. Amen.